Sorry, and I would agree to those you've already heard. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who made all things, according to Colossians 1.16, and for whom all things were made, the Son of our great Heavenly Father and Creator God. I hope we can honor Him during our time together. And we're just going to study together. I'm not a scholar. I'm a student just like you. I'm just maybe a little older than you and have been studying it a little longer than you. There are two kinds of expertise that are, that are helpful as we study this book, but we'll be studying the book from maybe a little bit lower level. Obviously, one is a great competence in Hebrew. So as you're so young and you're just starting out, most of you get all the competence you can gain in Hebrew. There is another discipline which impinges upon our study of the book of Genesis, and that is the study of science. And we'll be talking a little bit more about what that means. Um, we're not going to spend much time on um, what we call critical issues. The great critical issue in the book of Genesis is the issue of authorship. We're going to take the, the simple and obvious biblical view attested by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself in the New Testament that Moses wrote uh, the book of Genesis. Indeed, as he wrote the whole Pentateuch except for Deuteronomy 34 dealing with his own death. Uh, he, we know that his father-in-law advised him to get helpers for himself. And we know that he did get helpers. So it's conceivable that he could have had helpers and stenographers who took down his dictation or that he deployed editors in his ministry of composing the first five books of the Bible even as he had helpers in judging Israel. But the ultimate author of the book of Genesis is Moses. Now, how did Moses know what happened in the book of Genesis? It's quite possible that he learned everything through direct illumination from God. In other words, it's quite possible simply that God just told him. Um, it's more likely that there, wa there was preserved for him oral and perhaps even fragmentary written accounts which came down from Adam himself. The reality is that God the Holy Spirit has to superintend the preservation of the truth, the transmission of the truth, the composition of the truth. This is God's business. It's something that God has to do, and we trust that He did do those things. Now, we will talk a little bit about the critical challenges to Moses' account. We obviously live in a world where most people, including most educated people, reject the authenticity of the book of Genesis as far as the truth claims go. These challenges come from science in terms of the way the world is created and especially the way man was created. These challenges come from, in a way, philosophy, philosophy, but really in a way from an alternate religion, the alternate religion of atheism. 150 years ago, it would not have been necessary to teach the book of Genesis and talk very much about the critical challenges from science. Today, it is necessary at least to mention them. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about what the opponents to biblical truth contend. We're going to spend our time talking about what Scripture itself declares. Even 50 years ago, it would not have been so necessary to talk about the philosophical challenges which come from atheism. 
but it's more necessary today for Christian students and Christian teachers to examine and to prepare to answer the attacks from the enemies of God, which have become more public and which have become more aggressive. So we will touch on those things a little bit. In chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis, events predominate. Events which have to do with first occurrences, creation, the first man, the first woman, the first marriage, the first murder, the fall, um, the flood, the judgment at Babel in chapter 11. These are events, obviously. Beginning in chapter 12, personalities dominate. Abram, who becomes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the sons of Jacob, and preeminently Joseph. From chapters 37 to 50, the book is mainly about Joseph. So we will spend a lot of time on Abraham. Uh, we'll spend a good deal of time on Jacob. We'll spend an awful lot of time on Joseph. Beginning in Genesis 12, the whole Bible is about one man's family. The whole Bible. You and I are members of his family spiritually. There may be some among you who are Jews or who have the blessed privilege of also being in his family physically. But according to Genesis 3 and according to Romans 11, when we're in Christ, we are Abraham's children spiritually by faith because Christ is great Abraham's greater son. So from chapter 12 on, personalities predominate. Now, it's much harder to teach the first 11 cha uh, chapters. It's much harder for a lot of reasons. Uh, one reason it's harder is because most of the challenges which come to the Bible's authenticity come to those first 11 chapters. So it takes a good deal of, of scholarly depth to answer those challenges convincingly. I don't have the, that depth, but we'll talk about the challenges a little bit, on, and at least I'll try to point you in the direction of the answers. The word, the first word in the Hebrew Bible is the word barashit, and it means in the beginning. So the first words that we have in our English translations or our Russian translations is, is actually the name of the book in Hebrew, barashit. Uh, the beginning. And we have to ask ourselves the question, the beginning of what? It's not the beginning of God. It's my opinion that, that John 1, 1 talks about what we might call the celestial beginning. And of course, in a meaningful way, we really can't talk about the beginning of God, can we? Because He has no beginning. But Genesis 1 concerns itself with the beginning of terrestrial time, that is, the beginning of the cosmos, the beginning of the universe, the beginning of physical creation. The spiritual creator already existed. Now, here is one of our first problems, which is, for some people, a philosophical problem. And the problem is not with God. The problem is with the inadequacy of our own understanding. Namely, it's impossible for you and me to conceptualize anyone or anything who has no beginning. And God is a noun which cannot be modified by the word before. There is nothing and no one before God. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit in this opening session about the atheists who are attacking so fiercely in our generation. Your parents, and maybe one or two of you who are old enough, uh, you, you grew up in uh, an aggressively atheistic society. 
The West traditionally has always had its components of atheism, but they've not been very aggressive. As a matter of fact, in former generations, atheists were fairly complementary to Christianity. There was a famous atheist called Sir Julian Huxley who wrote a book in the 30s about religion uh, and morals. And he contended in that book that, of course, Christianity is not true because there's no God, but Christianity is the best thing that anyone has ever thought of. Christianity is the noblest ethical system. And so Sir Julian Huxley, his, his birth dates are his birth dates 1887, his death is 1975. He was a professor at Oxford, the grandson of Thomas Huxley, who invented the word agnostic, Darwin's great publicist. Anyway, Julian Huxley was in his family. And, and he suggested that we ought to act like Christianity is true, even though it's not. We should pretend that it's true because it's the best way to live. Now, we don't live in um, a generation like that anymore. There was a man at, uh, another man at Oxford, a professor of philosophy called A.J. Ayer. He died in 1989. A.J. Ayer said that Christianity is not only a false religion, it's, a, it's the worst religion because it's based on the immorality of a blood sacrifice and the immorality of someone taking punishment for someone else's guilt. And Professor Ayer said that's immoral, that's wrong. And so we have a, a moral attack on Christianity. Now, the two great attacks that are coming today are coming from two Englishmen an Englishman called Richard Dawkins, who until recently was professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford, a zoologist, and a man called Christopher Hitchens, one who's one year older than I am. Christopher Hitchens was born in England, but he became a United States citizen and he lives near Washington, D.C. Now, when you listen to their arguments, and I'm talking about this a little bit in the beginning before we talk about the text, because they cross swords with us in the first verse because they deny that there is a God. But I want us to understand why they say this and how the Bible and the Christian position answers their objections. If you listen to Professor Dawkins, what he is saying is, please, please, please don't believe in God because I can't imagine God. He's, he's contending God must not exist because I can't imagine a being like God. Well, when someone makes a plea like that, I want to know what kinds of things that they can imagine. And I want to know what kinds of things that they think about. Now, let me just tell you that Professor Dawkins is a very good writer. And he's a very hardworking, industrious writer of books. And I want to salute him for that, and I want to give him credit for that. I don't think he's a great thinker. He knows nearly nothing about philosophy. He knows nearly nothing about history. Um, as a matter of fact, Professor Dawkins was awarded the D. Phil, uh, the Doctor of Philosophy at Oxford, for research done on pre predicting the pecking patterns of chickens. Now, I'm glad that there are people who do that. We need people who do that kind of thing. But we don't need people who do that kind of thing determining our metaphysical categories and our, and our theological categories and telling us what's permissible for us to believe in and what's not permissible for us to believe in. Because Professor Dawkins' horizon doesn't, doesn't rise very high. He's concerned with chickens. We're concerned with God. Now, the reality is that we can't imagine someone who has no beginning. We cannot imagine someone about whom we cannot say before. 
our physical universe has a beginning, and that's what Genesis 1-1 talks about. But the author of this book who inspired Moses, he himself has no beginning. Spurgeon said this, I would not want to believe anything that I could completely understand because I would then have to conclude that it was written by one of my peers. That is, it was written by someone who was equal to me. This book was not inspired by someone equal to you and me. Now, here's what I would say to Professor Dawkins. I would ask him this question. Is it necessary for a higher order of being to exist, is it necessary that the lower order of being understand the higher order of being? Is it necessary for a dog's existence that the flea understand the dog? Is it possible that a dog could exist even though the flea doesn't understand the dog? Is it possible that a man could exist even though the dog does not understand the man completely? Is it necessary for a dog to understand a man completely for the man to exist? Now, how would Professor Dawkins answer that question? I think he'd say, no, that's not necessary. Well, then why does he make an exception with himself? Why does he insist that God cannot exist unless man perfectly comprehended God. If, man, if we perfectly comprehended God, then God wouldn't be God because God is infinite and we are finite, we are limited. God has no boundaries in His being, in His majesty, in His power. We do have boundaries, very narrow boundaries in our understanding. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. So, when we see in the beginning, this is the beginning of the created universe. In the beginning, God. The Hebrew word is Elohim. Um, most of you who've, who've had any Hebrew at all or who know anything about the book of Genesis or, um, will know that this word is what we call the generic word for God. Uh, it looks like this in Hebrew. And um, the interesting thing about the word, first of all, the root of the word means the strong one. The interesting thing about this main word, I think it occurs over 5,000 times in the Old Testament, this main generic word for God, it's used for pagan gods. It's used for false gods. It's even used in some cases of men and of angels. But the interesting thing about this word is that in many masculine Hebrew nouns, the plural is formed by adding two little letters, yod mem, the sound is im. And those two letters are right there. So the first time God is called God in the Bible, and most of the times God is called God in the Bible, the plural noun is used. Now, is this a, a proof of the doctrine of the Trinity? Is this an example of the doctrine of tr the Trinity? No. But it is a foreshadowing of the doctrine of the Trinity. And it is a proof that the very vocabulary about, used about God in the Old Testament allows for the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, how do, for instance, the Jews interpret the use of the plural? They would say that this is um, what scholars call in Latin a 
pluralis majestatis, that is a plural of majesty, the royal we. There's a story about Queen Victoria. The, the, the legend is that after Queen Victoria's husband died, and he died 40 years, almost 40 years before she died, so she lived a long time as a widow, it's said that she never smiled in public after he died. He died in the early 1860s, she died in 1901. And there was a, a famous incident where someone tried to amuse her, say something funny, do something clever, and her response was, we are not amused. Well, why would she say we? Why didn't she say, I am not amused? Well, because she was a queen. And kings and queens sometimes use the plural because they represent the nation. So, some people say that this is the royal, a, a royal plural because God is a great king. Some people call it a potential plural because it shows all the potentialities in God. The fact is it allows for the Trinity and the fact is we encounter other plurals in Genesis 1 which are suggestive of at least a foreshadowing of the doctrine of the Trinity in the very first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for create is bara. It is used, I think, in the Old Testament exclusively of God. It is not always used, there's another Latin phrase, creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. It's not always used to mean creation out of nothing, but many times it is used to mean that. And it means that in Genesis 1.1. God did not create the visible universe out of pre-existing matter. This is absolute original creation as far as our world goes.